I also want to welcome everyone to panel two on uh, differentiated integration in economic and financial affairs. And we have two very good speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Christiane Petit from DCU. And the second speaker is actually you, Stefania, um, Stefania Baroncelli from the University of Bolzano. And I think that since we do not have a lot of time and we would really like to have some discussion afterwards, I'm just going to pass on the floor simply right now uh, to, uh, to Christy. So please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. And uh, thanks to the organizers and to the Bridge uh, Jean Monnet Network for the opportunity to present. I need to say that it's the very first draft paper. So I'm very eager for comments, suggestions, remarks, and to engage on uh, the issues that I will focus on. So I was uh, kindly asked a few months ago to look at uh, differentiated governance in the European Banking Union. And uh, here is a contribution which is uh, based partly on the research findings and some of the um, research I've made during my PhD um, once upon a time at DEY a few years ago. Um, so the banking union completion is among the priorities of the upcoming French presidency of the European Council. Um, because it's still incomplete. There is a missing third pillar and it's um, on Times and again, in, on the political agenda, there's a joint declaration from last December with the three uh, main EU institutions confirming that they wish to put this as a priority in the legislative agenda. So for those of you who are not really familiar with the banking union structure, there is indeed a three pillar structure for the euro area, including a supervisory pillar, which is called the uh, single supervisory mechanism, a resolution pillar, also with the terminology mechanism, uh, so single resolution mechanism, and this missing uh, third pillar, which is the uh, common deposit insurance pillar, also called EDIS, so European Deposit Insurance uh, Scheme. Um, I will focus on other issues, but I, I think it was important to have an idea of this common house uh, with this pillar structure. And also to say that the member states which are not yet part of the euro area may join under a close cooperation. And I will look at this uh, in the second and final part of my uh, short presentation today. So there are some key objectives of the banking union and they are of course very important because they are trying to fix some of the shortcomings and the issues that we observed during the euro area crisis the great, after the great financial crisis. Um, of course, Banking supervision is to contribute to the stability of the financial system within the union, but also in each member state. And this is uh, the wording from secondary law. And this is where you already have an uneasy compromise and this combination between the union-wide ambition, so stability of the financial systems within the union, and the still significant national realities in the banking union construction. Of course, there are over key objectives, so to make banks safer and sounder, to prevent and also manage better some future crises at the bank level. And very important for all of us, I think, um, also avoid making recourse to taxpayers' money. We don't want to observe anymore those massive bailouts um, that happened uh, some ten, more than 10 years ago. So there is um, we, we can say, and or we may discuss in more details, but uh, inst institutional differentiation and differentiated governance are the byproduct of differentiated integration. And they are somehow at, at odds with the banking union project and also the creation of the banking union, considering the objectives that I just underlined, and also the adoption of uh, single rules, common European approaches. So there are different puzzles at stake. And um, just to say very clearly that um, there is this project of a European banking union, but this is still not yet European because we are within the euro area um, setting for now. So until the euro area is expanding it's, and we are reaching um, the union wide uh, geographical scope, then we may call uh, the banking union European banking union. But there are some aspects in terms of substantive rules, um, which are not yet fully harmonized. And the risk uh, that are created with uh, differentiated governance is to have some inconsistency in the approaches, 
the uneven playing fields across uh, the euro area, which matters especially for cross-border banking groups in, in this uh, sector, and some heterogeneous interpretation, but also enforcement of rules. So, and this would again uh, jeopardize the objectives uh, that I just mentioned for the banking group. Um, and yet, uh, differentiated governance may also bring some flexibility. It may also um, allow an integrated core to gradually integrate um, the out, so the remaining uh, member states which are not part of the banking union. And I wish to say very clearly also that um, in this paper, I have a rather pragmatic approach. Of course, I examine and um, engage with some of the differentiated governance features, but I take the I, I start from the constraint that we have in the legal framework, both at the uh, primary law level and at the secondary law level, and also taking into account um, the broader context and what was at stake um, during the political negotiations. So the fact that you had um, diverse member states' preferences between what could have been a fully centralized model on the one hand and a more decentralized model where you have this interplay between the national and the European level. So there is differentiated governance in the banking union and there will be for a while. Um, and what I do in the paper is to look at some of the features and some of the core governance within the mechanism. So more in the inter internal dimension in the first part and in the second part more in the external uh, dimension through the close cooperation that some member states may establish to have their uh, national authorities joining the, the mechanisms, so both the supervisory pillar and um, the resolution pillar. I distinguished three elements of differentiated governance in the banking union with three uh, categories, so differentiated governance from the top of the systems and um, in a cross-pillar perspective, so between the SSM and the SRM, but also in between the groups of ins, opting ins uh, of member states' competent authorities. Differentiated governance exists also from the bottom, but I could not look at it within this paper, but we need to acknowledge that within the system, you have the national authorities which are part of the systems and they still have their own uh, national settings. So in terms of independence, in terms of decision-making and governance models. Um, separate models and also resolution authorities. Um, so in this uh, short account, I will focus on the third category, which is uh, dif differentiated governance from the core of the systems um, and also the waiting room, so to say, to the banking union. So for the member states and national authorities that are joining the banking union under close cooperation. So, um, just to give a bit more precise information on the examination I, I carried out in the paper, I examined the contributions of joint teams. So joint teams are within both mechanisms and they are um, very important for both ongoing supervision and resolution. For the exact terminology, they are called joint supervisory teams and internal resolution teams. And in concrete terms, they bring together in a virtual dimension supervisors or resolutions actors that are sitting on the one hand in Frankfurt for supervision and in Brussels for resolution, but at the same time also um, counterparts at the national level. So national competence authorities within the single supervision mechanism and national resolutions authorities within the single resolution mechanism. And I demonstrate that they have an integrative factor within both systems, um, each of the system and also across system due to their composition, the rationale also of the setting of those teams that are uh, preventing some national bias that are also avoiding supervisory regulatory captures and even some regulatory and supervisory failures that we could observe um, during the crisis in some jurisdiction. So, and this is due to the composition. I will not list all the features, but they, they are really combining and integrating the, the two levels that you can observe uh, in the systems. 
and they combine expertise, diversity in profile, geographic belonging. Um, just to give an example, to avoid this national bias, the, the coordinator of the team cannot be from the same nationality of the parent authority established in one member state. So this is a way to, to avoid the national bias. Um, and also a very important feature of the composition is that the sub-coordinators of all teams are affiliated to national authorities. And it's a way to have this transmission chain between the local reality, local knowledge, and um, the European level. And moreover, they also use uh, common approaches um, using some horizontal functions. So um, just an expression to acknowledge the fact that within the governance of each mechanism, those horizontal functions are supporting uh, common approaches and common methodology, which is also contributing to these uh, integrative factors of uh, the teams. Um, I, of course, uh, looked at also some of the issues. Um, it's better when you're doing this kind of uh, argumentation analysis to acknowledge some of the limits. So in those teams, you may have multiple lines of comment because you can imagine that some supervisor have dual belonging or dual sort of functional duplication being um, reporting both to the national authorities to which they belong and also to the um, GST coordinator, which is then affiliated to the ECB or the SRB, so the, the two mechanisms uh, at the EU level. Um, but still, all in all, um, I consider that those teams constitute a significant progress for the cooperation, for, so for the exchange of information and coordination of the work carried in each pillar of the banking union. And much more integrated in comparison with the prior state of affairs, which was uh, colleges of supervisors or resolution uh, colleges. Um, and for the last few minutes, um, just in a nutshell, I wanted to uh, give an account of the status of new, particip new participating member states. So the new INS, which are in a sort of waiting room before their full integration into the banking union, we can simplify with uh, three stages. So prior their joining, the governance is of course differentiated as they are out. When they have the status of participating member state, the governance is integrated only to some extent. There are still some features of uh, differentiation. Um, and once they have joined the euro area, the governance then is fully integrated in the banking union. And um, what matters is of course the second step, um, and let me focus on, on this aspect. Um, there is unequal participation due to some constraints at the treaty level. So on the SSM side, the authorities um, that are under a close cooperation from those member states that are in, in the process to join, uh, they do not have full rights of participation in terms of decision-making and governance arrangements. And why is it so? It's because um, the treaty um, is establishing a governing council, which is a decision-making authority, ECB a decision-making body in the euro area. And in the arrangement which was adopted for the single supervision mechanism, they adopted a decision-making process creating an over authority, which is uh, created by secondary law. So the supervisory board. So the, the member states joining, they do have a seat in the supervisory board, but as they are not yet part of the EU area in the process of leading the negotiation to join the EU area, they do not have yet a governor in the governing council. So just to make it a bit clearer, if you have a bank which is um, receiving a decision for its own funds requirements, very simple uh, application of the uh, capital requirements regulation, the decision would be coming from the ECB governing council because this is a decision making body established by the treaties. But as the process is made within the SSM, there is a, a prior approval of the draft decision and the supervisory board. But just to say that the arrangement which is made within the institution is not giving full rights of participation uh, to the member states that are in the process of, of joining. Whereas on the SRM side, 
where you have, uh, and, and here I, I didn't have time to present it fully, um, you have an agency. So the SRM with a single resolution board, it's an agency created uh, with a secondary level act on the basis of Article 114 uh, TFU. And here uh, it's more, um, how can I say, uh, the, the voting rights are full and there is no special arrangement provided in the, in the legal framework. So the drawback that we can observe somehow sometimes from the agency structure here are kind of outweighed and they are part and they can express their voice fully. So skipping a few points because I, I guess it's, it has been long already, but just to say that this, this is important also because it's currently happening. You have Croatia and Bulgaria who are in the process um, to join the euro area. They are already within the SSM under Korea's cooperation since October 2020. Um, and they are in the exchange rate mechanism too. So meaning that they are um, progressing and there will be a convergence report due, I think, in the course of next year so that eventually they join the euro area and then the, the full rights will be aligned once they are within the euro area. So there is one pragmatic approach, which would be to say that the, the joining of the euro area should be as smooth and as quick as possible so that those two memberships are aligned and uh, rights of participation, expression of voice uh, are coming all together um, at the same time. So, um, just to conclude, um, there are also some work to simplify and streamline the pillar structure that I couldn't present uh, to a full extent, but fully integrated governance is an ideal. There are some steps that have been recommended, for instance, uh, the crisis management framework review from the commission. The, the work I carried out here is to look at the joint teams as an intermediate component that is relevant until we have real cross-border banking groups and we can create uh, the condition for their operation in a truly European banking market. And in a banking union with a functional uh, model whose core teams are very instrumental. And once we have the third pillar, they will also need to be integrated at the same uh, functional level within the core governance of the, of the mechanism. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Christy. That was really, really very interesting. Uh, I quickly pass on the floor to Stefania so we can have the second presentation and then a, a debate afterwards. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the presentation by Christy Petit. Um, actually, I think uh, that when we speak about uh, Europe uh, at multiple speed, two speed, uh, uh, it seems that um, everything uh, is possible that all the states uh, are deciding um, uh, their rhythm. And in reality, there are uh, differences among the states. Uh, so uh, some states are more eager to be integrated than others. Uh, and this emerged uh, very clearly from the presentation of, of uh, Christy, I think and also maybe from, from my presentation. So I will uh, share my screen. So uh, Euro crisis and differentiated governance in the European Economic and Monetary Union. So that's uh, my uh, presentation. Um, so actually I will use a little bit uh, uh, the three-step approach used by Federico also <laughs> in many um, articles that he has written about uh, this topic, uh, so the Maastricht uh, uh, Treaty, and then uh, the, the second step, uh, the Euro crisis, and then uh, finally the third step, uh, uh, the uh, new generation EU and recovery. Actually, it's true that uh, the, the, they bring two different directions in a certain way. So uh, in the Maastricht Treaty, as we know, there was uh, a political differentiation from the start uh, originated by the UK, uh, and it was a political differentiation. The UK didn't want to participate. And uh, of course, after the UK, we uh, couldn't say no to Denmark, uh, and there were two differenda on, on this about the, the, the Treaty of Maastricht. Uh, so uh, Denmark uh, or obtained uh, a, an opt-out. Then there is uh, the case of Sweden, uh, which uh, um, received a de facto opt-out. So this differentiation 
between states with a derogation and without a derogation was created from the start. And uh, uh, so that's why we speak about uh, the economic and monetary union uh, as a multi uh, two speed, uh, as an example of two speed uh, integration. However, there was also uh, a differentiation which is not political but created by uh, economics, uh, an asymmetry. Um, and uh, this uh, originates from the fact that. Uh, of this uh, uh, well-known uh, economic convergence criteria, 3% of the budget uh, um, and uh, to GDP and 60% debt to GDP, which were established in Maastricht. Uh, and the fact that only the states which fulfill the convergence criteria could adopt the euro. It was a decision a little bit imposed by Germany, and uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to go into that uh, uh, because of economic theory and also for political reasons. So uh, this uh, choice from the beginning uh, had uh, some repercussions on the EMU governance. We, uh, the, there was a distinction between uh, the ECSB, so European System of Central Banks and the Euro system. Um, it is interesting that the ECSB is a concept which is non-operational until all the member states adopt the euro. So instead, we use the concept of euro system, uh, which includes the ECB and the central banks of the eurozone member states, uh, which is uh, uh, the, the, the one which uh, uh, the ECB enacts legal norms uh, in the field of monetary, monetary policy. Um, there are also some repercussions uh, on the ECB setup, uh, uh, the fact that uh, um, uh, the central banks of the out do not nominate the president, the vice president of the ECB, and then uh, uh, the governing council includes only the governors of the central banks of the Eurozone, while the general council uh, the governors of all the central banks. However, the governing council is really the decision-making institution within the ECB. Um, why there was this type of differentiation? Well, the derogation was deemed, uh, as I said before, as provisional. So on the perspective that all the states of the European Union would have stayed, uh, would have joined the, 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 the euro in the future. The euro was seen as irreversible, no possibility to go back to past. And in fact, the withdrawal uh, was included only in the, in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, a further, uh, let's say, uh, element of rigidity is the stability and growth pact. Why? Because actually it reiterated the rules, the Maastricht uh, rules of economic convergence also for the future and crystallizes the asymmetry among the states. It's true that uh, Maastricht, uh, um, uh, there are some automatism in the treaty. So uh, if a state joins the European Union, it is obliged to fulfill the convergence criteria as they are part of the acquis communautaire. And when criteria of economic and legal convergence are reached, uh, then uh, uh, the member state uh, has uh, to adopt the euro. Also, if a state adopts the euro, then uh, not with Maastricht, uh, but with uh, the banking union, so it joins the banking union. Uh, so I uh, made a, a figure here to show uh, how in Maastricht, uh, uh, you see, so I distinguish between uh, uh, the, um, uh, the euro area and the member state uh, on the one side, uh, and then, uh, uh, sorry, uh, and then uh, uh, the intergovernmental sphere and the EU framework, legal framework. So it's very simple in Maastricht, uh, we had uh, the ECOFIN uh, CSB, but actually uh, the euro system was created for the euro area. So with the euro crisis, uh, um, actually this uh, uh, asymmetry among the states, between the states uh, was uh, deeper. Uh, so uh, from the north, south, per creditor, debtor states, um, and uh, also the type of governance and uh, uh, had, uh, was influenced by, by that. 
So the Eurogroup emerged uh, as a leading uh, uh, organ. And uh, it is true that the treaty, uh, the treaties provide the possibility to, um, um, uh, for the state of the Euro area to have uh, a coordination and to intervene. Uh, but uh, there is no legal base for asymmetric shocks. In fact, uh, the only article uh, that is present in the treaty, Article uh, uh, 122, um, was interpreted strictly because of the fear that uh, the southern states uh, would have infringed the no bailout clause. So the solutions, uh, you know, are, are, are these uh, six pack, two pack, uh, the fiscal comp, the European stability mechanism. So I have tried uh, to um, uh, to find a way to uh, to study them and identified uh, uh, some categories, uh, as you can see here. So basically, I distinguish the measures that apply only to the euro area. They may have some hybrid measures, so measures that apply to Euro area uh, and also to EU member states. Uh, the intergovernmental treaties, which are open to all EU member states, uh, and finally the uh, opt outs. Um, so the measures that apply only to the Euro area, in fact, the issue was uh, mainly for uh, the uh, Eurozone. Um, is uh, the two pack, uh, which is based on uh, an article uh, 136 of the treaty, uh, treaty of the for, uh, of uh, functioning of the European Union, and the ESM. In that case, uh, as you know, um, article 136 uh, was amended with a simplified procedure. Uh, however, in the, the new article, uh, it is said that uh, disbursements are subject to strict uh, conditionality and um, ESM is, is based on an international intergovernmental treaty, but is managed by the Commission, the ECB and the IMF, and it was subject to challenges by constitutional court. As you can see here, I have uh, put uh, uh, some uh, Light and so I have described the governance of the monetary union, economic and monetary union during the, during the financial crisis. So you see the two pack and the uh, is here in the eurozone and the euro group. Uh, then um, other measures are hybrid measures uh, um, like uh, uh, measures targeted at euro area member states but open to all EU member states like the six pack. Uh, I don't. I, I don't have the time to go into depth, but the six pack provides for the so-called European semester, ex under coordination for member states' economic policies, and it applies to all the European Union member states. But sanctions are applied only to euro area, and the governance is based on European Council and European Commission. Then there is a banking union. Uh, already, Christy has spoken about that. The idea is that the euro area member state must join the uh, SSM. Non euro area member state can join the SSM. Um, and then uh, she already spoke about uh, the role, uh, which is uh, in certain cases uh, asymmetric because uh, uh, the non -euro, non euro area member states are not in the governing council of the ECB. Intergovernmental treaties uh, open to all EU member states, the third category. We have the fiscal compact, uh, which is aimed at Euro area, but open to all. It is an intergovernmental treaty outside the EU, but open to all. Uh, there was a problem for UK and the Czech Republic, but now everybody, all the states, except for the UK, which is out, uh, are part of the uh, TSCG. However, uh, as we will see, uh, the states uh, which are not uh, in the Eurozone can choose uh, the title. Uh, uh, so it, it, there is a differentiation, actually, uh, because uh, the differentiation is among the Euro area member states. Uh, uh, the fiscal compact requires the ratification of only 12 Euro area member states to enter into force. And among the non-Euro area member states, uh, 
they can opt in, as I was saying before, and decide which title to choose. The opt out, uh, I don't, uh, I have already spoken about that. I think the case of Der Denmark is uh, very interesting um, because it has uh, a parallel system uh, which resembles the one of uh, uh, the European Monetary Union. So as you can see here, we have the out member states, but uh, some uh, member states are more out uh, than others. So uh, Denmark, uh, is, uh, is nearer, I would say, and, and the Croatia and Bulgaria, uh, as uh, also Christy was saying, uh, they are uh, in uh, the process uh, of uh, joining uh, um, the, um, the Eurozone. Uh, let's say they are in the year M2 and uh, in the banking union. Then the pandemic, the new generation EU, everything changed, uh, everything, uh, uh, the, the, uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the Stability and Growth Pact was suspended. Uh, the ESM, uh, the uh, history conditionality was eliminated uh, if the funds were used for health reasons, uh, the new plan was established. Uh, and what is important uh, is that uh, this plan is based on uh, art one article of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which deals with social cohesion. So it is really within the system. Also the, the SUR, which is also a very important uh, fund, uh, which be, because actually it is shared by Germany, so this is uh, an important issue, uh, is based on the treaty, uh, the REACT EU, uh, and then the fact that funds are financed through Corona bonds and not with transfer of state funds is very important. So here I have put this uh, new REACT EU, new generation EU, sure. As you can see, uh, the difference is striking because uh, we uh, pass from, uh, uh, Euro from the Eurozone, so measure for only for states of the Eurozone, to EU 27. Uh, so before the new generation EU, uh, we had uh, uh, a more differentiation between a group of states uh, and the growing importance of the Eurogroup uh, and the Euro Summit. Uh, on the other side, uh, there was uh, the problem of a lack of political control. We were speaking about uh, the setting up uh, of a Euro area parliamentary assembly. Uh, because the problem is that uh, the European Parliament represents all the member states of the European Union uh, and decides about issues uh, which are proper to the Eurozone. Uh, and then uh, also the other issue emerging was intergovernmentalism and the European Council uh, and the international organization linked to the European Union. The problem is that decisions here are taken with unanimity so that uh, stronger member states can always veto and uh, for example, uh, uh, the ESM is unviable politically. So conclusion, uh, uh, I don't want to say more because uh, as you know, uh, it is very complicated. So uh, uh, we want uh, a, a wider union, we want a faster union, so a more efficient union. Uh, we know that uh, the European Union is united in diversity. So how to reduce the differentiation and preserve uh, the European way of life, the welfare state uh, that uh, Helle was speaking uh, correctly about that. Um, we know that uh, the treaty changes require unanimity by the member states. So we, uh, in my opinion, we have to think about what are the accepted values uh, within the European and monetary economic and monetary union. So we want to put uh, really price stability, growth, employment, ba balanced budget. So they are really uh, some values that we have to accept. We, do we want uh, a, an ESM type of governance? Uh, I think in my opinion that uh, we can go also back to Maastricht uh, with adjustments, uh, uh, changing the budget rules, uh, Federico has uh, written extensively on, on this issue, fiscal mechanism. Uh, of course, uh, in all the systems, uh, uh, federal system, uh, asymmetric, uh, uh, non-asymmetric, uh, 
um, we need uh, some clauses of constitutional homogeneity. So uh, a sustainable principle of equality and trust should be at the heart of the new system. So of course, uh, a more flexible governance mechanism can apply, um, but uh, we really have to find a way to develop programs uh, um, having the advantage that uh, to tie the economic growth of slower area to that of faster ones. And this can uh, happen only on the basis of uh, a principle of trust. So I stop here. I hope not to be too long. Thank you so much, Stefania. No, you were definitely not too long. And it was very interesting to listen to your presentation. Um, we now open the floor for any questions or comments that anyone could have. Um, you can raise an electronic hand or you can even send me a mail in the chat, uh, in the chat, sorry, but uh, yeah, any, any way you want to. And of course, Stefania and Christy, you're also very welcome to, to sort of comment on each other's uh, presentations since this is in a way kind of a related area. It's also a very technical area. I'm not sure everyone in the audience are experts in this field, but even if you are not, you are very welcome to uh, step in. I can see Federico wants to make the first move. Please do, Federico. Well, I, I don't want to abuse uh, to uh, abuse the opportunity of, of, of speaking, but I, I am so much tempted to ask a question because obviously this, this topic is, uh, is something I'm very interested in. On. And, and I think I want to congratulate both Stefania and Christy for, uh, for two excellent presentations. Perhaps we should have done them in the reverse order in a sense, because obviously EMU comes before uh, banking union, but, but I still think it, it was really very helpful to have the two of you uh, speak together. And I suppose uh, I have, a, 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 in a sense, a general question to, to Stefania and Christy, and then maybe a, a more detailed one. And the general question is, is this, if, if I, uh, um, understand Stefania's argument correctly is that what we are seeing in response to uh, the pandemic is interestingly uh, a kind of uh, convergence of all the member states. So uh, economic governance moves beyond being uh, an area of differentiation to being instead one where all the 27 are participating. And that's, that's a big change from Maastricht, and it's also a big change from the Euro crisis. Now everyone is in next generation EU, everyone is in, in the sure mechanism uh, and so on. But at the same time, so this could be the achievement of economic integration. But at the same time, Christie's argument is that in the banking union, you have all of a sudden lots of forms of differentiation, perhaps below the radar, because I think one, one point I was uh, I found it interesting in your in your talk, Christy, is that I mean we always focus on the kind of the high level uh, of differentiation about states, but you kind of started looking at how these mechanisms of micro governance uh, work in practice, and there you have lots of differentiation. So I'd be interested in hearing what you think about this. Is is it that if we don't no longer have differentiation at, at the at the the top, but we have it uh, at the bottom uh, to use uh, Chris terminology. But maybe Christy, you can also explain to me what you mean by differentiation at the top, differentiation at the bottom, differentiation at the core, because I, I wasn't sure uh, of, of, of uh, the significance or really the meaning of, of, that, uh, of that distinction. And, and then I might have another question, but I'll stop here for now. Okay, thank you so much, Federico. So I'll pass on the floor directly since I cannot see any other questions at this time. So people can just think about it while we are listening to Stefania and Christy. So Stefania, would you like to start? And then Christy, you can take over, please. Yes. Uh, um, in fact, uh, my, my point, yes, was exactly that. that with the pandemic, uh, there is a shift uh, to a more... Uh, European integration idea. Uh, however, um, yeah, at the same time, uh, we really have to think from uh, from from the bottom, uh, from the bottom, from the start. What are the values uh, which cannot be uh, that are essential, essential for the European Monetary and Economic Union? Because at the beginning, uh, basically, this uh, um, structure, 
So the fact that uh, uh, the European Monetary Union and the ECB was aimed at reaching uh, the price stability was uh, the price that we had to pay to have Germany on board. Otherwise, we couldn't have had it. And uh, um, at the same time, the treaties and the, also the Treaty of Maastricht is rich. So there are, uh, um, so if, if we read the treaty, it, it says that the ECB has uh, to reach uh, uh, a low inflation. So, uh, um, but then uh, it has to sustain uh, the uh, economic growth uh, of Europe. However, these rules have been uh, interpreted very strictly and were biased by a certain uh, um, economic ideology that uh, uh, brought the, the, the integration procedure in a certain direction. So uh, I think that uh, it really depends that we can save something of our Maastricht I idea but based uh, on a more equal footing and sustainable equality among the states. Thank you. And Christy, would you like to take over? Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Federico, for your comment and your question. I will focus more on the second, maybe then do a, a first general comment on the first question. Um, so I, I used Fu's terminologies out of simplification, but it's true that maybe I was a bit too fast um, explaining how those two systems are operating at the moment. The fact that um, there is a centralization of supervision to some extent. So the ECB is a common supervisor for 114 uh, banking groups and banks at the moment. So those are called significant institutions. And within the system, you also have the national supervisors. So the national competent authorities, which are competent for the, all the remaining less significant institutions. So this is where you have some differentiation because the, the decision, if we look again at the bank's perspective, the decisions that are uh, binding and that they receive in terms of capital requirements, et cetera, depending on their size, and there are different criteria in the legal framework, but they, it may come from the ECB if it's a significant institution, or from, um, let's take the Central Bank of Ireland, if it's the national supervisory authority of uh, one bank or one group, which is uh, considered a less significant institution. So this is um, where you can uh, identify some of the differentiation in terms of governance. And here I'm not talking about differentiating integration, really governance. So uh, looking at the decision-making rules, processes, um, I couldn't include behavior and uh, outcomes because I think it's more field work oriented and this is not within the scope of this paper. But looking at the decision making rules and processes, there is definitely a differentiation there. And I uh, mentioned it only quickly, but when I uh, use the expression, I simplify and use um, differentiated governance at the bottom, it means that if we look, um, and let's take the supervisory pillar, for instance, if we look at the national authorities, they are not organized and structured in a similar fashion. So if we take, and it's a good example to take Ireland, actually, because the Central Bank of Ireland is uh, an integrated structure. You have a lot of functions combined within the same entity. But if we take um, over authorities at the national level, so for instance, in France, ACPR, so Autorité Contre Prudentiel et de Résolution, has both uh, supervision and resolution, but you have over aspects which are functionally separated. And this is what I meant by differentiation there. And I'm not having a normative argument of saying it shouldn't be this way, um, just that um, it, it's definitely different. I know a colleague, a peer, who is also looking at those aspects. Um, so, but this is not within the framework of, of this paper. So maybe I should uh, use a different um, um, terminology or just explain why I think it's important, but then just say why I'm not uh, looking at it. I, I hope I clarify. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, I actually had a similar... Ah, sorry. Federico, you want to say something? No, no, go ahead. I will follow yeah. up. Um, yes, so the, the fact that with the coronavirus and the COVID-19 crisis, uh, in a way we have much, we, we are achieving more economic integration and we are finally working with the union-wide um, scope. And actually I also had a, a question for Stefania in this regard. So 
asking ourselves and well, nobody can look into the future, but is this giving a way forward or is it very specific to what we have uh, experienced and lived with the coronavirus? And adding on this, because I really like the, the two um, figures that you made in between um, the um, coronavirus crisis for the third one and the prior um, version of it with the great post uh, financial and economic crisis. But if we look and if we put in addition to that, then maybe it, it could lead somewhere. I don't, I don't have the answer, but the ongoing um, climate crisis, the fact that also in our fields, we have green financing, uh, very important changes in uh, green central banking. And maybe this could be um, somewhere and we could observe. I, I wouldn't say now where it is. I hope EU union wine definitely. Um, so that was a, a comment rather than a question or just to know your thoughts on that. Thank you. And I think that was a very interesting comment, actually, Christy. So let's hear what Stefania says. And after that, I also have a, a question for from uh, Ian. I, I, I think that uh, um, from this table that uh, I have made, uh, and I, at the beginning, I said that uh, not all the states are the same. And in fact, there are uh, some states, uh, for instance, Denmark, uh, is out, uh, but in reality it is in because uh, it has uh, um, created this parallel system which is very similar to the uh, European Monetary Union. And I think it is a smart move, the one of Denmark, I <laughs> must say, because uh, politically she has uh, more uh, power. So it, it can introduce uh, very much more easily some uh, reforms uh, like tax reforms uh, like job reforms uh, uh, and at the same time uh, it stays uh, in. Uh, in what uh, in, in other states in the eurozone uh, this uh, the idea uh, this you know this discretion is blocked uh, by different players uh, so that's uh, that's a problem at the moment that we are stuck we are, we are rigid uh, um, however, if we look, uh, 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 because you were saying also, Christine, uh, the, 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 the case of Croatia in Bulgaria and uh, uh, Denmark, that they are out of the Eurozone. However, they are uh, keen to go ahead. So if we start from, from that, so who is uh, in, uh, formally or not informally, and who is out, then we can start uh, to go ahead, because if you are, if you don't want, uh, you don't want. Uh, so it's like uh, in a marriage, uh, if you don't want, you don't want. At a certain point, um, it's, uh, it's there is this clash of values. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, my presentation was positive because. Uh, um, going back to Maastricht, to this idea that uh, everybody will join, not everybody, but uh, a good part uh, of the team uh, is, is joining. So let's, let's start fr from there. And, and that, because actually uh, the problem is the one of uh, unanimity and majority. So if we really want uh, a union which functions, we have to use the majority. If we, we are stuck to unanimity, we are not going uh, no, nowhere, in, in my opinion. I, I think that Ricardo has an, a, a question. Yes, thank you so much, Stefania. Uh, I would have liked to join in here myself, but I'm going to pass on the floor first to, uh, to uh, Ian and then to Ricardo. So Ian, please go ahead. Thank you for these uh, excellent papers. Um, I wanna pick up on what Christy was just saying about differentiated governance um, and what she refers to as uh, different decision-making rules and procedures as distinct from different um, uh, EU-wide rules or treaty provisions that, that uh, apply to different countries differently. Um, and so I would ask uh, Stefania, um, you know, I mean, you've done a great job of like showing kind of all the different forms of differentiation within an economic monetary union over the years and coming out of the Euro crisis. But I would put to you that there's another form of differentiation and that is the bailouts. 
that uh, for a number of for for a number of years there were a bunch of countries um, that were that were subject to the troika memorandum of understanding they're subject subject to a completely different kind of regime of governance of their um, economic uh, system um, on a temporary basis uh, while they were going through this process of a bailout now and i would I would put to you that you could call that a form of differentiated governance. And it was temporary and they came out of the other side of it. But, but it's funny to talk about the story of the Euro crisis without talking about that, because that was really kind of the most dramatic uh, aspect of the Euro crisis. Um, but, and I would, I would kind of uh, pull, like come forward, coming forward and thinking about the, the recovery fund Yes, the recovery fund uh, is no longer, it, it now covers all EU 27 member states, but um, you still have this possibility that, uh, that uh, states could have the funds uh, withdrawn or withheld if they uh, don't meet the criteria in terms of rule of law. And again, this would be a kind of a differentiated governance in terms of the way that fund is uh, being administered. Um, and, I'm, and I'm trying to, what I'm trying to, say is you know in bridge in in the bridge network we use this term differentiated governance we haven't developed it all that much but it, it is intended to be broader than differentiated integration and to trying to um, expand the definition of what we're talking about when we talk about differentiation thank you so much i think we'll just take a few more questions so we, i also have a Ricardo Rovelli on my list, and we also have a question from from uh, Rui Pinto. So, uh, uh, Mr. Rovelli, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I I would like to pose a question to Stefania Baroncelli, mainly, I suppose. Um, I think uh, we have been discussing you've been discussing the, the issue of differentiation in governance, uh, mostly with respect to whether you're in or out uh, um, uh, with respect to the existing mechanism with the existing institutions, uh, uh, the consolidated policies of the EU. Um, I think uh, um, this is important, but also that uh, what uh, shape this debate will have about who is in and out will, uh, depends a lot on, on uh, the issues that we are discussing now, the new challenges. Um, uh, one, of course, as was just mentioned, uh, is uh, the issue of debt. Um, because of the next generation EU and the, the, uh, all the policies to exit from the, from the crisis, uh, the debt criterion is obviously being totally uh, overrun by almost everybody. Uh, so, um, this is not, so this opens two questions. One is about how uh, the, the, the rule for reigning that will be formulated and who will participate and whether it will be differentiated with respect to different member states uh, within and out of the EU or the Euro area, uh, but also uh, whether the fiscal compact still makes sense, because now we have discovered that we need a lot of deficits to finance uh, uh, both the exit from the recession and, uh, uh, and the uh the trans the green transition uh you know like for, for for our country italy uh we we had a huge debt until uh, for many years but uh, at least until uh, before the pandemic we had a primary surplus now it is accepted we have a huge primary deficit which changes completely the the, the picture, the outlook for fiscal policy and debt. So this is going to be an issue of paramount importance. Uh, also, uh, just to make it briefly, the issue of own resources. We are, the debate on own resources is completely changed. Uh, until uh, February uh, last year, we were discussing the, the sort of the pressure was to reduce uh, the ceiling on own resources. Now we are discussing uh, how to increase them, how, for which purposes. And there is the issue of common debt. Um, uh, and in general, uh, the, the, all the issues posed by the climate change, the, uh, the green transition, uh, think about the, uh, how to deal with the stranded assets. You know, countries like uh, Germany, but especially Poland, 
have enormous stranded assets. It means uh, the coal mines, for instance. Uh, the, uh, this requires, of course, a mechanism of new mechanism of governance, uh, new policy. So uh, this will um, sort of favor this debate about all these issues will favor a, a lot of differentiation uh, between countries, and possibly uh, the solutions will be not the same for everybody. So I, I, I don't know if you would like to comment on this. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a question from Rui Pinto. My question is about uh, the solidarity approach in the context from uh, EU, especially in, in cases of crisis that we are, uh, we are living or we have been living uh, for, for a while. Um, what is the what is the the, uh, the the answer from the panel about this question? Um, if it's possible, the concept of solidarity be a leverage to uh, to solve some issues from the governmental crisis, like populism in some EU countries, or solidarity is like an ideal that uh, depends of the consent of the will from the, the other states means it's just uh, this idea that I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting question. We have been granted 10 minutes more by Federico Fabrino, so thank you so much for that. So I'll just throw in one last question also uh, to you, Stefania. Um, because you were talking about the Danish case, so I, I kind of have to, I guess I have to throw in a question here and I will do that. Um, because that in a way inspired me to ask you which role the, the, the background for these opt-outs actually play, because I think somehow maybe we should also try to get in the national level. I think that would be a very interesting perspective because of course in many countries, it's just up to the government in a, in, in a way or maybe government and parliament to the legislator to, to, to just decide that you don't want an opt out anymore. But, but I don't really think that's the situation where I come from in Denmark. So it's of course, there's a political reality also in this. And, and as you say, for instance, Denmark has joined in as much as it could or a lot compared to many other countries will opt out so we are doing what we can but but i guess facing this political reality that we have had two referendums also and and that somehow the voters just don't really want this if, because voters are not always logical i guess you know it might seem crazy because we are already taking part quite a lot but but i'm just asking i guess about the political reality and this what about the background for these opt-outs and which role do they play uh, in in when when we discuss this differentiation and and how we might be able to to maybe uh, create more unity and efficiency in the EU in the future so thank you so much and that was it was a lot of questions sorry but stefania do you want to start and then we pass on the floor to you after it's christy and then we kind of try to round up so just say anything you want to know no, okay, I, I will begin uh, with the, uh, the issue of the opt-out. Uh, it's true, it's a completely a national issue. And actually, if you think, it's interesting that the populists uh, uh, really are pro-referenda. So that, that's the one uh, who promotes referenda. So um, even uh, uh, the, uh, the banking union, uh, so the, the issue was, uh, should we, um, uh, should we um, set up a referendum or not? Uh, but uh, in reality, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, when uh, um, there is no consensus, uh, then for uh, the, the national government, uh, it is uh, useful uh, to use the referendum. Uh, it is very useful for, uh, internally, uh, you know. Uh, consensus at the European level. So if uh, if we think that we can gain something, uh, the, the, the government can do that. Uh, it is uh, a success internally. Uh, of course, uh, uh, as we have seen in the UK, uh, the referendum um, can be, should be managed uh, very uh, carefully because it can bring to results uh, that uh, are not uh, uh, wanted. But in, in any case, in the past, uh, the referendum was used to obtain more, to, uh, also in Ireland, for instance, to obtain some opt-out opt out, uh, from the treaties. Um, and then uh, 
the bailout uh, Ian was, uh, of course, uh, I, I didn't speak about the uh, the, the bail the the, the, the bailout, uh, but uh, it is uh, the the hidden uh, concept uh, in the room uh, because uh, actually it uh, um, basically the, the the concept of bailout uh, um, uh, obstacles uh, the, 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 the 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 construction of the fiscal capacity within uh, the, the the union. So it is there, and uh, we have to deal to deal with with that. And everything wa that was done, uh, it was based on an interpretation of the no bailout uh, rule, uh, and uh, uh, on the fact that there was no trust on some states. So basically, everything uh, can be explained by that. So uh, yes, of course, the no bo no bailout uh, rule. Uh, is uh, the, 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 the conceptually the rule. Uh, as uh, um, well, the concept of, uh, yeah, uh, Rui Pinto is asking about solidarity. It's, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's correct. So uh, the solidarity uh, is uh, the catchword that can be used uh, in, in, in every case, but uh, it can be influenced uh, by some uh, some groups of states. So what is solidarity? And uh, we go then to the presentation of Federico and Ian. So who, uh, what kind of states? Uh, there are there groups of states uh, uh, that can influence the concept of solidarity. Um, I think that uh, we can, uh, uh, from the point of view of the Economic and Monetary Union, there are some data that we can use. So for instance, and I go also to the question of uh, um, Riccardo uh, Rovelli. Um, uh, so what is the debt? Because now with the, uh, with the new generation EU, the past debt remains. So it's, because we, we are speaking about the Hamiltonian moment, uh, in reality, in the United States, uh, it, there was a different uh, procedure because it was the past debt uh, which was uh, eliminated. Here, the past debt remains uh, in Europe and uh, even uh, increases uh, because uh, we will have uh, to, uh, not everything, but to repay what we are having now. So the debt, uh, uh, as the new catchword is also sustainability, so is the new debt sustainable? And if we discuss this issue in a practical way, I think that a solution should be found. Because you know, if you look at the debt, which is increasing, and you keep the same methodology, it doesn't work. So we have really to change the the system. So there are a lot of things uh, that I would like to, to say, but uh, I think we are running out of time. Sorry. Thank you so much, uh, Stefania. And we move on to you, Christy. Yes, uh, very shortly, also in the interest of time, I will pick up on uh, solidarity because actually this is something which is very important for the third missing pillar. So this is where I started the introduction of my presentation um, this morning. So it's told in the negotiations because indeed you have uh, no consent at the level of member states uh, in terms of sharing uh, liabilities. So meaning that uh, in the banking regulation, there is huge effort put into risk reduction, which is the, the key term. And you have a coalition of member states saying that this is where progress should be made before moving to risk sharing which is part of this solidarity stick approach, you know, the, uh, having solidarity between the participating member states uh, of the banking union. Uh, so, so this is just to illustrate and say that, uh, in a way, I'm opting for the second uh, definition that the participant put forward, which is kind of ideal that depends indeed on the consent and the coalition of uh, will among member states. And I, I will stop there. Thanks. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Christy. And then as a constitutional lawyer, I, I just can't help myself from just having to mention that actually some national constitutions actually require referendums in certain situations. Uh, and, and they can be older than, than when these member states actually joined the EU. I don't think there's any strategic in that. But, uh, but sorry, I just can't. I, I'm a constitutional lawyer. So that's where I come from. But this was a fantastic panel. And I just want to thank both you, Stefania, and, and, and also you, Christy, for these really fantastic papers. They were very high level, and I, I, I think they raised some really, really good debates uh, in our forum. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you to all the audience.